We're excited to be here. That is awesome, man. Welcome to Beacon Hill Church, man. This is awesome. We're the Word of God today, and I'm excited that you're here. My name is Michael Moore. I have the privilege of being the pastor of this fellowship of believers. If I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, uh, I hope I get a chance to meet you out in the hallway of the house after uh, service here at Beacon Hill Church. Man, we're just a broken people serving an unbreakable Savior. We don't try to act and put on a facade like we've got it all together. We realize that we are imperfect people and we need Jesus Christ to straighten us up, right? Amen. Jesus is able to do far more with our broken selves than we're able to do on our own. And so we're on mission here to learn about Jesus, to, to grow deeper in Jesus, and then be sent out on mission for Jesus. And so if that sounds like a church you want to be a part of, welcome to Beacon Hill Church, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm thankful to be here today to worship King Jesus together. I can't think of a better place that I would like to be today than here in Hopewell, Virginia, preaching the Word of God. I can tell you, Jesus is better than any football game that's going to come on later today. Jesus, Jesus is better than any Black Friday sale that's coming up. Jesus is better than having a day off this week. Jesus is just simply better, church. I mean, and we're going to learn about this Jesus this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it is preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Open them up to John chapter 18, where I'll be studying verses 12 through 27 this morning. If you don't have a copy of God's Word today, just raise your hand and one of our Beacon Hill peeps will bring a copy to you for you to use. The words will also be coming up on the screen. Also, if you would like a copy of today's manuscript uh, that I am preaching from, just raise your hand and they will bring one to you as well. You can also sign up uh, on our Facebook page by giving us your email address and we will send one to you every Saturday uh, until you block me. Okay, John chapter 18, verses 12 through 27. Uh, if you would stand in honor of reading God's word this morning. By the way, I, I was going to preach all these verses last week and I just I just uh, said God just told me to slow down. And, uh, and so we're going to hit them this week. John chapter 18 verses 12 through 27 the word of God says this. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to ask for, for he was the father in law of Caiaphas who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, though, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But what I said is right, why do you strike me? And it's then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Let us pray. Dear Holy Father, I thank you and I praise you for your word. Lord, I thank you for being able to be here today to proclaim your word. Lord, I thank you for every single person that you have brought here today to be able to hear the word preached. And Lord, I know that your word will not return void. 
So, Lord, I pray that you would be with me now, your servant, as I proclaim your word, that I'll be able to proclaim it with boldness and with conviction and clarity of speech. Lord, I pray for the hearts of the hearers to receive the word. Lord, not only, not only receive it, but, Lord, dig into the truths of it. Lord, that they would know the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that Jesus and only Jesus Christ saves. Lord, this broken world needs an unbreakable Savior. And, Lord, I praise you that we have one. So, Lord, I pray that if someone is here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them, and we would rejoice in that. Lord, now may I decrease and you increase as I proclaim your word. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we praise you. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's sermon, Playing with Fire. Playing with fire. You know, um, at our house we have a gas fireplace. And in that fireplace, the pallet light is always on. I don't know if it's supposed to be always on or not. I just have no skills whatsoever. So it stays on at our house. And the glass is always hot. When we had our youngest daughter, and she was about two or three, one day she made the voyage to the fireplace. You ever had one of your kids do something stupid? Where you knew it just wasn't going to end well. Like when I grew up, we didn't have. When I grew up, uh, we didn't have these uh, protector plates. We didn't hire people to come in and put all these safety switches over there. You know, my dad, if he saw me pick up some keys and head towards the light socket, he would just say, "Try that out. See how that works for you." That's just called growing up in the South. Anybody in there with me? Know what I'm saying? But as we watched. Rachel make a voyage to the fireplace. I, I, we, we said stop or something like that. We certainly didn't say let me get my video camera out, you know, because we understand that that didn't work for us. As a matter of fact, if you've ever wondered what is wrong with me, you can tell that I've had too much on-the-job training growing up. But as Rachel started going towards the fireplace, she started quickening up her speed, and it was too late to stop. It was past the point of return, and I watched her put all five fingers on that hot fireplace, church. The screams, the, the, the pain that came out of her mouth, and it was like I wanted to take that pain away from her, but unfortunately she had to find out for herself that fire burns and fire hurts, church. I tell you that to tell you this. Too many Christians today are walking too close to the fire. They're walking too close to the fire of sin. And when you walk too close to the fire, you're eventually going to get burnt. Has anyone felt the pain of sin in their life? Have you felt the pain of sin? Whether or not you were the cause of it or somebody else sinned and it caused pain in your life, sin hurts, church. Not only does sin hurt, sin hurts more than you. Sin hurts your family. Sin hurts your friends. Sin hurts the church. But you know the one whose sin hurts more than anybody else? Sin hurts God. Sin hurts God. It separates you from God. And yet God loves you so much that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whoever shall believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He gave His Son as a substitute not only for your past sins but your future sins. Isn't that a great God we have this morning? Look, it must have been so tough to watch the the father to watch his son go to the cross of Calvary and go through what he went through. You know what? Here in America, people sit there and go, you know what? I'm going to hell and I'm driving the bus with all my friends. Sin is not something to laugh about. It's something to repent about, church. When we look at this passage today, I want us to see how one of Jesus' closest disciples, the one who should know the most, Fell to sin in his life. I don't care how close you think you are to Jesus, you are not immune to sin. Do you get me this morning? Yet Jesus' mission doesn't stop just because you're going backwards. Jesus is going to continue on with his mission. So I want us to see through this scripture 
literally how Jesus' plan is going forth. But yet, as a disciple of Christ, we have to guard ourselves to being just like Peter. Here in verses 12 through 14, we see that we are part of a bigger plan. We're going to see Peter's to sit here in a minute, but before we get there, we see what's happening with Jesus. Is anybody here watch This Is Us? You ever seen that show, This Is Us? It is so hard for me to keep up with because it, it keeps switching scenes back and forth, and I don't even know what's going on half the time. So I have to really pay attention because it's all working together as part of a bigger story. And when you look at this passage today, we start to see different scenes going on. It's almost like this is us. We see Jesus going to the trial, which is he's going to the cross. And then we bounce over to Peter and, and what he's doing, denying Christ. And we bounce back to Jesus. Then we bounce back to Peter. So you have to really understand what is happening. And I think John is showing us this picture to help us realize that our lives is part of a bigger plan. Everything that we're going through in our life is part of a bigger plan. While we may be going through motions in our life, Jesus never stops being on mission church. While we may come in here for one hour a week and get fed, Jesus Christ never stops the other 167 hours a week. So may we be on mission for Jesus Christ. These opening verses not only shows us the next step, of Jesus on his way to the cross. And by the way, do you know Jesus Christ is coming back, church? Amen. You know Jesus Christ is coming back. Every breath you take is one step closer to Jesus Christ coming back. And so we look at this passage and we see everything going on. People want to ask this question to me all the time. And people say, man, why can't this world be a better place? You ever ask yourself that question? Why is there so much pain in this world? Why is there so much hurt in this world? Then we need to pray for this world to get back in the hole. Do you understand that the world has made its choice to rebel against Jesus Christ? The world has made its choice. But Christian, you have been set apart from the world. You are not of this world. You are from the kingdom of heaven, and we are just passing through on our way home. Do you get that this morning? Amen. I'm thankful for that. And yet our mission is to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others can come with where we're going. So may we understand that we're part of a, a bigger plan. Yet this world doesn't understand that. This world can't possibly understand what our plan is and, and what our king's mission is. And so they think that they are doing things that are going to eradicate Christianity from this world. You know, when you look at this passage, we see people who think that they are doing uh, their, their world and justice by trying to take Jesus to the cross. You know, even these soldiers thought that they were part of something bigger than themselves. They thought they were doing the world a favor by arresting Jesus and tying him up and taking him to the cross. They didn't get that they were just part of a bigger plan. Do you think that these soldiers really could stop Jesus by simply tying him up? Church, if you were here last week, You'll see from passage, and if you got your Bibles, just look back. These soldiers got off their butts just by the sound of Jesus. And they think a few ropes is going to stop Jesus Christ from doing what he came to do? You can't stop Jesus Christ, church. In fact, the symbolism here in the scripture is great. The one who came into the world to bring freedom and apart from whom freedom is absolutely impossible was himself bound. But he was bound in order that we might be set free from our sins. John was showing us that the temporal was absolutely necessary for us to live eternally. Even the sham of a trial that was taking place, the sham of a pre-investigation of Adam was part of a bigger plan. Caiaphas, who was the high priest, had advised the Jews that it would be better for one man to die for the people. He thought it would be better if one man, Jesus, would die so that they could have peace again. He didn't even know that he was speaking prophecy because it would be better for one man to die for the people. But it wasn't just any man we were talking about. It was Jesus Christ who died so that you and I could live. He didn't know that he was speaking prophecy. Jesus' plan is unfolding in front of a lost and broken world. 
Yet do you know that the world will continually try to eradicate Jesus Christ? Matter of fact, the stats show that within 20 years, there will be less than 10% of Christians here in America. But you know what? You can't stop Jesus Christ, church. It is impossible to stop Jesus Christ. You can try to take prayer out of school, but it won't stop Jesus Christ. You can try to take the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse, but it won't stop Jesus Christ. The Supreme Court can even try to dictate religious laws, but it won't stop Jesus Christ because the Supreme Court can do many things, but it cannot put Jesus Christ back in the grave. Yeah. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that and the 10 people that are excited about that this morning. <laughs> you know, I think it's so important that we get that. It's so important that, that all the pain and the brokenness that we see in this world is only temporary. But it's also important that we see that we must be attached to the vine. We must hold on to Jesus Christ. You know, it's why I am so big into our community groups and, and, and celebrate recovery and things that we have during the week because so many times I see people that are removed from service because of sin in their lives. You know, I am so thankful that God has planted us here in Hopewell, Virginia to be a part. I wish I could share with you. It would take me hours just to share with you what Jesus has done this week in our church. Amen. It's been absolutely, I mean, church, people, I, I went to breakfast Friday morning. Somebody gave me a hundred bucks for our church. Woo! We've got over 40 turkeys that are being delivered. We had so much food that was delivered to our house last night that we're going to another church service this evening just to pass it out. Look, God is blessing this church, but you know what? Can prevent you from being a part of it? Sin in your life. Don't take sin lightly. You know, we see in Peter, and I want you to see what's happening in Peter's life is, is how just some subtle choices kind of started taking him away from being on mission for Christ. I want you to see that how even the closest of disciples wasn't too big to fail. In verses 16 and 17, we see Peter walking towards the fire. We know that Peter was, was known for his boldness. He was known for making uh, writing checks that his body couldn't cash. He had just told Jesus earlier that he would follow him anywhere. And Jesus, knowing what was happening, knowing that he was fallible, said that you, the rooster, will not crow until you have denied me three times. Peter didn't think Jesus knew what he was talking about. But this passage shows us that Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. When the soldiers took Jesus away, Peter and another disciple followed behind. This is not so much to talk about and why Peter was outside and what was inside, but I want to cut through to the point. The servant girl who was working the door asked Peter a simple question. He says, you are one of this man's disciples too, are you? And Peter said, I am not. You know, on the surface, what Peter said seems like a little white lie. I mean, you really can't blame Peter for not acknowledging that he was a disciple of Christ. After all, he just cut off a man's ear. He was a pretty public person. He would probably be wanted by many people. So he was trying to not draw attention to himself. So you can, you can understand why Peter would simply say that I am not one of his disciples. God knows my heart. Have you ever heard someone say that? Have you ever heard God knows my heart? And yet, maybe Peter was intimidated by his surroundings. And maybe whatever it was, but there was this one little white lie that he talked about. He answers the doorkeeper with, I am not a denial of being a disciple of Jesus. It was a little lie that began a shameful descent. You know, boasting of our abilities is an imitation of failure, church. I don't know how many times in my career I have seen people boast and what will not happen to them. You know what? It actually makes me cringe when I hear somebody say that will never happen to me. It just makes me cringe and almost want to just videotape that moment. You know, one of the reasons I got into ministry was this couple that was just on fire for Jesus Christ. They went to Monroe Park and fed the homeless and, and, and every single weekend. And they, they did it as a family so the family could be together. And yet, one Saturday, they came across this man 
And they, they started talking to the man. And, and he, he opened up his wallet and, and showed them a picture of his family. He said, this is what I used to have in my life. But my sin cost me my family. And now I'm living homeless here in Monroe Park. And as they were leaving that man, this, this friend of mine turned to his family and said, that will never happen to me. One day, when him and his wife had a fight, he went to his boss for counseling, and his boss offered him a little crack to get through his problems. His boss said, one blow won't hurt you. Two years later, that man not only had lost his job, he had lost his house, he had lost his family, and one Sunday night after a Redskins Cowboys game, I'm telling you, I remember it clearly as can be, I got called that they found him dead in a hallway of a hotel. Don't ever say that it can't happen to you. Don't ever say that you were too big to fall. Take the things in your life seriously that are affecting your relationship with God. Peter got what he wanted initially, a little closer to Jesus, but he found himself standing next to the fire of Satan. And yet, as I told you, this, this passage goes back and forth, back and forth. While Peter is starting his fall, Jesus is still being Jesus, we see in verses 19 through 24. Peter's outside warming himself by the fire while Jesus was inside being interrogated. The high priest wanted to know two things about Jesus. He wanted to know about his disciples, and he wanted to know about his teaching. About his teaching, they were looking at a theological issue. They wanted to know if what he was sharing was leading people astray. But the issue here that I want you to share is, is the issue about disciples. They wanted to know how many disciples that he had. They wanted to know after they killed him, how many people were they going to have to put up on the cross so that his teaching would be completely eradicated. You know what Jesus did? While Peter was outside denying him, Jesus was inside standing up for his disciples. He sat there and said, look, it doesn't matter how many disciples I have. It doesn't matter what I taught them in private. You know why? Because my message in private was the same as it is in public. My message doesn't change based on what I'm in here or out there. Let that be a lesson to us. May we preach the same message in here as we do out there. May we be the same person out in the streets as we proclaim to be here. May we be unashamed of Jesus Christ. May we worship him out there as we do in here, church. Amen. And as we sit there and we see this, Jesus was sitting there saying, there's plenty of witnesses. You leave my disciples alone. There's plenty of witnesses that can testify. So why are they are hitting Jesus and binding him up. And he is making a beeline towards the cross. Peter is getting closer and closer to the fire. We see in verse 25, Peter having a need to stand close to the fire and warm himself is John's way of indicating the chilling fact of Peter's failure to live up to his earlier boast of following Jesus even to the point of death. Peter just told a little lie now his integrity was at stake. Would he be all that he said he was going to be? And yet he responded with, I am not. Church, when I look at this passage and I see Peter just standing around the fire with all the opponents of Jesus, I just start thinking about Psalm 1-1. When the Word of God tells us to not stand in the counsel of the ungodly. Peter here is standing with the ungodly. He is standing while his, his actions are on himself. Peter willingly did sin. Peter willingly denied Jesus Christ. But yet his environment did not help him stand up to Christ. Let this be a warning to us all. Standing with the wrong crowd is not going to help you draw closer to Jesus. Do you get that this morning? If you're struggling with heroin, if you're struggling with alcohol... It might be your environment that's the problem. Flee from that and cling to Jesus Christ. Do you get me this morning? There are things in your life. Don't walk into a bar if you struggle with alcoholism. Walk into church. Do you know why there are people who go to seven celebrate recoveries a week? Every night of the week they're going to celebrate recovery because they know 
left on their own. They will make wrong choices. They know that they need to cling to Jesus Christ. Don't fool around with sin, church. You may need a change of environment. But you have to make the decision to walk in the counsel of the godly and not the ungodly. Peter should have followed the counsel of Jesus and gotten out of there when he said, let my people go and here I am. Take me. I'm the one you're looking for. Peter should have fleed, yet he found himself as close to the fire as he's ever been. Then we see in verses 26 through 27 of Peter in the fire. Have you ever tried to cover up sin in your life? Have you ever tried to cover sin up? How's that work for you? Like, but you do something wrong and you try to cover it up. Like, I remember one time I was shooting fireworks outside of a bank, which probably wasn't the best idea. And the police showed up. And uh, I was holding a firework behind my back. And he goes, what's behind your back? I'm like, nothing. You know, I didn't try to do anything. Like, and it didn't work. You know what? Your sin's going to find itself out. Amen. You know, what you do in the dark is going to be brought to light. Did we get that this morning? And yet Peter thought that he had made it clear. He, he thought he had got in closer to Jesus. He was standing by the fire. He thought it was clear, and yet he didn't realize. Matter of fact, i got to tell the story because no one knows this person. I can talk about you if you don't come to church. There's no reason to come to church. Right? <laughs> I was down in Myrtle Beach at a golf trip one time, and, um, and uh, I stayed at home the whole time when the guys went out partying. You know, I didn't want to go out there. I, you know, I was reading the Bible, so I just didn't go. <laughs> so I was in there, and uh, the guys went out dancing, and, and this one guy um, married for like 30 years. He went out dancing, and he was dancing with a girl on the dance floor. And when he turned around, you know, I don't know, doing the shag or whatever that dance is, he turned around. And his wife's best friend was on that dance floor, Myrtle Beach, y'all. And he lived in he lived up in Northern Virginia. And the first thing he says, well, I guess I'm about to make a phone call to my wife. <laughs> you know what? You can't hide sin in your life. As much as you try to, or as much as you think you can, you can't hide sin in your life. You know, Peter was sitting there thinking he had it scot free. And yet he sat there, and this person goes who was a relative of Malchus. He's not, I believe you are a disciple of Jesus. Because you know why I know that? You're the guy who just cut off my, my, my cousin's ear. I watched it happen. I was there. There was no way for Peter to deny that at that point in time. But yet you know what he did. And you know what happened at that moment in time? Peter was starting to, to curse other people. You know when you fall to sin, when you're going through sin in your life, don't you try to blame everybody else but yourself? Don't, don't you try to make everybody else the enemy? And we look at the other gospel accounts of this, this, uh, this time here. We can see Peter actually cursing. Then he starts cursing himself. And then he hears the rooster crow. And then he goes away and he weeps bitterly. You know what? That's what sin is supposed to make you do in your life when you're convicted by it. You should be broken by sin in your life. And yet we see Peter doing exactly this. He realized that he had sinned against Jesus Christ. And he was fully engulfed by the flames of sin. But I got good news for you this morning. I know a guy who can get you out of that. His name is Jesus Christ. You know when you look at scripture. and You can Google it if you want to. But it's a great passage where Jesus is talking to Peter. And he says, you know what? Satan has demanded to have you so that he may sift you like me. But Jesus says to Peter, but I have prayed for you. Isn't that a great thing to know that Jesus Christ has prayed for you? Isn't that great this morning, church? And he sat there and he said, I prayed for you that your faith would not fail so that when you turn, when you turn from your sin, you will strengthen not only yourself, but you'll strengthen others with your story. Has anybody got a story here this morning? You got a story of sin in your life? Maybe you're sitting here and you're struggling with sin right now in your life. Maybe you think you can't be used because of sin in your past life. I got good news for you this morning as we see later on in the Gospel of John, Peter was restored to service. Don't think that God can't use you because of something you've done in your life. It's as simple as this this morning. As we come time to this time of invitation, you simply ask God for forgiveness. You know, we're going to have prayer team up here, and you can come and you can pray with us this morning. You can lay it down the altar. You can pray at your seat. But Literally sit there and say, God, you know, I've done things in my life that I know doesn't honor you. Maybe I have taken sin so lightly in my life. 
And Lord, I need you to clean me up this morning. And the great thing about our God, when He forgives, He forgets. He wipes you clean. Do you want to be clean this morning? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. The Word of God says this, that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Do you want that this morning? Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him, then you shall be saved. So I don't know what you've got going on in your life this morning, but I know that you need to take it seriously. You've got something that is affecting your relationship with God. So I'm going to pray and want to ask you to respond this morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. I thank you for being a God who saves. 